I will start the deck. Okay, so uh, welcome one and all to the uh, July uh, Drupal MIC meetup. Uh, I I believe I'm your host for today. My name is Holing Poo, uh, not David. David has entrusted me with his credentials, so he uh, helped us make this uh, meetup happen. Um, so our, our rough agenda is uh, as of six o'clock, we were joining the call and then kind of like slowly rolling in. So I'm gonna about to start the announcements on the deck and then uh, 6.30 is where the activities happen and at 7.45 is the closing remarks and socializing. So um, it says, uh, please mute yourself while I'm not speaking at the bottom of the slide and also please use Drupal MIC Slack uh, meetup channel uh, at drupalmic.org slash Slack if you want to join uh, and not use the Zoom text chat because once we close the Zoom, um, the, the chat will be gone. So if you want to have some important information you want to save, you would want to go to uh, Slack and uh, keep the conversation there. Uh, some housekeeping, uh, please turn on that video camera if you are comfortable, uh, mute yourself when you're not speaking, uh, don't use text chat, again, it doesn't last beyond the meetup, and use the meetup channel in Drupal MIC Slack uh, to introduce yourself and other meetup attendees. And tonight we will have our introductions, there's a job fair, there's a talk, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, there's also uh, a problem solving session and then followed by a show show hour. Um, meetup doesn't happen without organizers. Uh, organizers are volunteers. Please join us. Uh, thank you, JD. Thank you, Sean. And thank you, David, uh, for help making this meetup happen. And we would love you, love to have you help us organize the next one. Uh, join us at the meetup dash organize channel at the uh, Drupal MIC Slack space. And to connect, uh, we're on Twitter, uh, uh, Drupal MIC. Uh, follow us on Twitter, uh, join us on Slack. Um, all, all of the uh, meetup messages uh, should be at the meetup channel. And uh, again, to join us, uh, go to drupalmic.org slash Slack to uh, follow the instructions on how to join. Please support Drupal Association. Drupal Association um, in charge of uh, the DrupalCon um, that gives a support to uh, our fellow Drupalers. Um, we we um, uh, we we have talks from time to time, like for example from Neil, and we talk about uh, the progress of Drupal. Uh, so this is our um, monthly PSA. Please support Drupal Association. Uh, go to drupal.org slash association for details. Upcoming events. This is exciting. So Drupal Camp Asheville, uh, July 8th and 9th. That is tomorrow <laughs> and Friday. If you haven't registered, go, go, uh, go to the registration link and register. The couple days, that is next week i i will be there because i i help rent a couple days so i'll see you next week if if you can uh it's free this year i i just i would like to emphasize that yes we we have changed it to free this year go to um 2021.decoupledays.com for for details hit the registration link um register via hopping and you'll be there uh design for drupal boston is july 23rd um Drupal Camp Colorado is August 6 through 8. Uh, I, I would like to point out from last month's slides, uh, Drupal, uh, uh, Drupal Gov was at a different date and it got rescheduled sometime in October. But for the newest dates, uh, uh, let, let's finish the rest of the list. Uh, Drupal Diversity and Inclusion Camp is on August 13th through 14th. And if you see any of the date changes, uh, only drupal.org slash community slash events has the most accurate dates because the organizers will go up there and give you the newest updates. So uh, please go to that page. Help us organize uh, Drupal Camp NYC 2021. Uh, we are going to be at October 20th and 30th. Uh, it's hybrid uh, at uh, Microsoft uh, and online. 
uh, help help us uh, get involved. And uh, you you can join us at a camp organize channel on Drupal NYC Slack or email us as a camp hyphen volunteer at DrupalNYC.org. Uh, join us. <laughs> Um, we have Drupal Lunch and Learn. Uh, if this is not the most convenient time for you, we as I've done every uh, third Tuesday of each month. So the next one is in two weeks, July 20th at 12 uh, noon. Uh, learn something new on company time. And if you're not ready to join this meetup because it's running late, uh, uh, subscribe to our newsletter. Uh, Bit.ly uh, slash DMYC hyphen mailing hyphen list uh, for, for more details. Subscribe to our mailing list for, for the newest updates. Are you interested in speaking? It can be any length. It can be a lightning talk. It can be a medium length. It can be a full case study where uh, you have them, we want them. It can be beginner, advanced, or even non drupally if you're interested in speaking, contact one of the organizers uh, from the previous slide, contact David, contact JD, contact Sean, contact me, or uh, better yet, the easiest way to remember how to contact us is via our email address, speak, S-P-E-A-K, at DrupalNYC.org. Introductions, we have, I see, uh, I see 16 people in this room. Uh, and according to, yeah, it says 16 participants, 17, <laughs> as near our scale, just join us. So if anybody want to go around the room and introduce themselves, that would be great. Uh, I see to the left of me just because I'm looking at the group, uh, Ralph Collar, are you, are you ready to introduce yourself? Yep. Hi, uh, I'm Ralph from Nuremberg, Germany. I'm in content strategy and, well, I'll pass it to uh, Eric. I guess that means me. Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. Was... Eric. Oh, that's okay. No, most most people call me Eric. I I like to go by the big E, but every time I try oh. that, I no no don't do that. Every time I try that, people call me the beige. And I'm like, all right, the beige is no good, right? So, so stopping right there, it's Eric, but well, well, you know, happy to meet you. Um, see you again, actually, Ralph. Um, yes, I'm Eric. Um, I've been working for almost six years now with um, MSKCC, which is a Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Um, I'm a, a, what you call a back-end developer in the Drupal um, system um, and in, in coding in general, although now I've been actually learning the... Um, uh, the full stack um, in a big way, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's great. Uh, we're on Drupal and uh, practically Drupal nine. Um, and I'll give it to Neil. Hi, uh, I'm Neil Drum. I uh, work for the Drupal Association on the engineering team there, and. Uh, yeah, I live in uh, upstate New York. Uh, I'll hand it over to <laughs> or, or Scott. Yes. <laughs> I am Scott Walpo. I'm in Story, New York. I uh, do Drupal, work on Node.js and uh, MongoDB. And we work on various projects, you know, small to medium sized projects. And looking forward to uh, Drupal Camp in October. And I'll pass it on to I'll pass it on to to JD. This is kind of fun. I like this uh, passing it on thing. Hey everyone, I'm JD. Uh, I'm a freelancer in Jersey City, and uh, you will hear more about me later. I'm going to pass it on to Kermit. Hey guys, uh, I've been at MSK, well, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center for what 14 years now, uh, alongside Eric on his team now. And um, yeah, we're almost on Drupal 9, right, basically. And been going to these meetups for a while, took a little time off, working on some projects. Uh, I'm back now. So great to see you guys. I'm looking forward to today's talks. I'll pass it on to, let's see, uh, Anne. 
Hi, thanks. Uh, I'm Ann Bonham. I'm I live in San Francisco. I'm crashing tonight because I'm interested in uh, migration. So I've been doing a lot of that lately, uh, specifically D7 to D9. So this appealed to me. I work with Amy June at Canopy, uh, mostly a D8 developer and just starting to work with D9. And let me pass it on to Michael. Hi, I'm Michael, and I'm in Brooklyn, New York, and I've developed a few sites in Drupal 7, and I'm looking for a training program that will bring me up to Drupal 9. I've been holding my breath for the CWA uh, Union Web Services training program that's supposed to start someday, but hasn't started yet. So here I am, and I'll Michael, pass it on. Mike will make an announcement right after August 1st. Oh, yeah, that's what you've been saying for a while. Oh, that's, that's and I'll good. pass it on to David. Yeah. But thanks, Scott. All right. Appreciate that. Oh, sorry. Pass it on to Neil. Uh, no. That. Actually, my name is not David. Yes. <laughs> my name is Holling Poon. I'm the Hi, MC Holland. for tonight, and I work for the New York Public Library. And I'll pass it on to Luke McCormick. Hi, I'm Luke McCormick. I don't know if you can see me. I'm not on my usual equipment here, so I don't know which way the camera is pointing. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I'm actually from New York, but I haven't lived there in a while. I live in California. I'm currently in Fort Lauderdale, uh, Florida, finishing up a... Uh, a, a Drupal 8 project and, and I'm looking for more work actually. So, so I'll be paying attention to the job board. Um, and uh, I'll pass it off to my buddy, Amy June. Thanks, Luke. Uh, I'm Amy June. I work at Canopy with Andy. Um, I live in the San Francisco Bay area, but just outside enough where I say I where lots of folks say I can't say I live in the San Francisco Bay Area because it takes me 12 minutes to get to public transportation that will take me to San Francisco. So I live 12 minutes outside. Um, I work in the community, um, doing community things, and I help um, Holing and a few others on the call with Drupal Camp New York City. Um, and that's looking to be the first Drupal Camp I'll go back to since the pandemic but i do want to give a plug that drupal camp Asheville is tomorrow online and folks still have time to there's a training um for mauricio on migrations tomorrow and if you want to ping me i can get you the zoom code if you want to attend any of the trainings or anything because i think they're all closed at this point but we're pretty loosey-goosey about everything um and i'll pass it over to hussein thanks amy <laughs> so i'm uh, hussein I live in uh, Mississauga, Canada, and uh, I'm more into management lately, but I've been working as a Drupal backend developer full stack pretty much over these, um, what, 12 years now? It's been long. Um, yeah, and nice to see everyone here. I'll pass it on to who's uh, Jason. I think, yeah. Jason. Yeah, sure. Yep. Hi, I'm Jason. I'm a uh... JS and Drupal developer in Brooklyn, New York. And uh, I'll be doing a, sharing my perspectives on a large migration in September. So I'm um, curious to see what JD is gonna come up with and see if I can borrow some of his ideas. And I'll pass it along to, I don't know who's left, Al? Hi. Yep. Can you hear me? Awesome. My name is Al Sierra. I'm a senior web developer for a company called Cloud Red out in Brooklyn. Um, I've been doing Drupal development since Drupal 6. Um, I've joined a couple of your meetings over the past few years, so I'm just happy to be here and listen to me. I'm going to pass it on to Scott. I already, already spoke a little, there's another Scott. I believe Nerich hasn't gone yet. Nerich? That's, that's right. Hi, this is Niroz. I work for iHeartMedia. I'm, uh, I'm working in Drupal for the past six, seven years now. Um, I'm, we are in Drupal 8 and soon moving to Drupal 9. 
Sweet. I believe that's everybody. So I'm going to keep forwarding the slides to see what we got. Well, maybe Salim. Have you introduced yourself, Salim? Oh, Salim? I, yeah, I should go. Yes. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm Salim. I'm uh, from Denver. I'm, uh, I, I, I'm the CTO at Dev Panel. And uh, we have a Pantheon slash Acquia like system for uh, running your own websites on uh, on AWS. So, and I've been in DevOps sysadmin since uh, since the nineties. So that's me. Nice to be here. Thank you. So yeah. Uh... So we have the Who's Hiring slide featuring a very lovely Ramona. Uh, is anybody hiring? Um, please let us know. Uh, Canopy Studios is hiring. Um, we do half WordPress, half Drupal. And so we're really looking for folks who um, can be project managers or WordPress and Drupal tech leads and engineers. And we're also looking for folks who's um, focus might be accessibility. Um, that's becoming a, a hot item for us. Um, so we're looking for a few different kinds of folks and feel free to reach out to me or Anne if you have any questions. Uh, anybody else hiring? Uh, I have a client uh, who is hiring. They're looking for a uh, business analyst uh, somebody to, who can convert business requirements into functional requirements and somebody who has a good Drupal background uh, with which to do so. If you're interested, please get in touch with me. Uh, so uh, last but not least, the New York Public Library is looking for a Microsoft 365 uh, person like with admin skills. I know uh, we're in a Drupal community, but since we're talking about hiring ads, uh, I would like to diversify a little bit and say that we are hiring. Uh, we we do hire different positions, but the current one that's being highlighted is that when uh, the plan is to migrate from G Suite to uh, Microsoft, and we we need as much help as we can get. So if you heard anybody who has the skills and who would like to join us, uh, uh, please let let me know. <laughs> Uh, let me see. Next slide. And we're at today's talk. Uh, Ask me anything. Migrating 1 million entities from Drupal 7 to Drupal 9 using Drush and Migrate API. Uh, uh, JD, uh, this is all yours. Thanks, Oling. All right. Yeah. Let me try so let me... to share, share my screen here. I cannot share because you are sharing. Sorry. Let me stop sharing. Here we go. How are we looking? Looks good. Okay. Let me know if you see any problems because I have had issues with uh, <laughs> presenting uh, from Chrome and Zoom. Sometimes it does not like me. So hello everyone. Yes, we were talking about uh, a recent migration uh, that I completed. And um, I know there had been a request from some folks in the community to talk about migration. So I put my hand up. Now you're stuck with me. Um, so to start, um, I'm JD, I said I live in Jersey City, and I've been developing with Drupal for over 15 years, and of those, uh, over nine of those, I've been doing that professionally as a freelancer. Uh, my focus is on complex web application development, and I also volunteer in the Drupal NYC and the Drupal event organizers communities. So today, my goals are uh, first, to explain the project requirements, my approach, and some lessons learned rebuilding the Drupal 7 builderlairman.org on Drupal 9 and migrating the data, and primarily uh, to answer your questions. This is an AMA, um, and so we can dive into anything you want. Could be about contrib modules that were used, custom code, custom migration, configuration files, uh, how I use Drush on the command line, uh, how I stayed organized, um, you know using some spreadsheets, uh, whatever, whatever sounds good. Um, but before we get to the project, uh, I wanted to just say a little bit about 
my client. So uh, my client is the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History. I'm going to call them GLI. Uh, and they were founded in 1994. And they are a leading nonprofit dedicated to K-12 history education. And they also serve the general public. Uh, their mission is to promote the knowledge and understanding of American history through educational programs and resources. Uh, they provide access to primary source documents that are in their collection, the Gilder Lehrman collection. And that collection physically is located on uh, the Upper West Side in the lower level of the New York Historical Society uh, by appointment. Um, it's also online. A lot, of it's, a lot of it, most of it, all of it's online. Uh, and the programs from GLI have been uh, recognized by a whole bunch of awards, including the White House, National Endowment for the Humanities, uh, you name it. So <clears throat> they do some really cool things. Uh, be sure to check them out. Okay, so project requirements. Let's see here. Okay, overall goals. Um, so the, the big picture goal was to replatform from Drupal 7, which had Civi CRM and Ubercart and Solar, uh, all of which was running on DigitalOcean. And the direction that we took was uh, to replatform to Drupal 9 on Pantheon, <clears throat> uh, plus Salesforce, Soapbox, Soapbox Engage, Talent LMS, and Open Solar. We'll talk more about those later. Uh, big goal was to minimize costs. Uh, it's a nonprofit. Obviously, <laughs> they're not interested in spending a lot of money uh, on, uh, you know, website kind of necessities. Um, and to, to minimize costs, we were looking to minimize changes to existing functionality, keep the scope low. And uh, we were also looking to move key functionality and technology off of Drupal to platforms that are easier for the GLI staff to manage. Uh, we wanted to allow the GLI staff to focus on the existing website and other operational needs that they had uh, during the upgrade process. And we wanted to minimize disruption to GLI programs and their participants. And we also wanted to embrace best practices. Okay, so <laughs> diving into things that needed migration to Drupal 9. Uh, there are a whole lot. Um, so there were a handful of blocks. And because there are only a handful, we decided to just migrate those manually rather than try to automate that. Uh, 14 of the 33 content types were deemed worthy of migration. Uh, there were entity view modes, field collections, uh, 118 out of the 227 fields. Um, there were many more field instances, uh, but those were the unique fields. Uh, there were uh, over 100,000 uh, files, managed files uh, that took up about 71 gigabytes of space. Uh, filter formats, image styles, menus, menu links, about 75,000 nodes, um, path aliases, path auto patterns, redirects, uh, rules, uh, almost half a million taxonomy terms. There were 19 vocabularies. Um, there were a handful of text formats. We had over 400,000 users. Uh, we had 31 out of the 42 uh, user roles that we <clears throat> wanted to keep. Uh, view modes, uh, views, which we migrated manually, uh, Google Analytics, uh, publishing workflow, site search, and some send grid, send grid integration, uh, all of which was uh, more of a manual uh, lift. There was some new work, uh, so we wanted to improve the user registration and uh, user profile editing experiences. Then the extra, extra large item was a Salesforce integration, um, so we created a new taxonomy, uh, vocabulary for schools, uh, which we were syncing from Salesforce, and then uh, Drupal users and Salesforce contacts needed to be set up with a two-way sync. Uh, we also implemented a single sign-on with Talent LMS uh, using Simple SAML PHP. Uh, there was also a new paragraphs-based content type uh, for landing pages, uh, a new content type and some custom uh, module code to pre-fill forms, which had moved to Soapbox Engage. And uh, then open solar for site search. Then there was the pan setting up Pantheon. Um, there was a whole bunch of miscellaneous module configuration um, <clears throat> for uh, modules that were used in Drupal 7 that were not available in Drupal 9 or that we chose to use a different module for. And then there were the best practices things, setting up backups and good caching and uh, CI CD uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment pipeline. 
uh, using GitHub Actions on uh, GitHub to Pantheon. Uh, we used config split for some per environment configuration. Uh, we used Composer for dependency and patch management, Honeypot for spam prevention and stage file proxy uh, to allow developers to work on the site without having to download 71 gigabytes of files. So thankfully there were some things that were out of scope uh, that included uh, the self-paced courses. Those moved to Talent LMS, uh, the shop, so there was e-commerce for purchasing self-paced courses and for purchasing subscriptions and memberships um, to GLI's programs. That moved to Soapbox Engage Shop. Um, big reason for doing that over uh, Drupal Commerce, um, you know, new build on Drupal Commerce was that it came pre-built with integration with Salesforce. And that would have been uh, an extra heavy lift on the, the Drupal side. <clears throat> uh, web forms. Web forms, uh, we moved to Soapbox and Gage forms, again, because it integrates directly with Salesforce. Not to say you couldn't do the same thing in Drupal, uh, but that was gonna be the easier option for the team. And then Civi CRM moved to uh, Salesforce. Uh, that contained information about uh, members, uh, program participants, donors, who attended what events, uh, things like that. Uh, and then the front end theme, uh, I'm not a front end guy, so uh, there was a team uh, that ported the uh, existing Drupal 7 theme to Drupal 9. Okay, so our approach. Uh, okay, got a few slides here about the rough sequencing of kind of what happened when. Uh, we're going to dive into some of this a little more. <clears throat> so first off, uh, we didn't have sort of an upfront discovery process. We had more of a di continuous discovery process. And this was primarily because the GLI team had a full plate of work. So they couldn't dedicate uh, the time that would be needed to do all the discovery up front. Um, also, we were dealing with uh, concurrent discovery and implementation of the migration from Civi CRM to Salesforce uh, by another company. Um, so that was, that was an interesting challenge um, for, for a project this large. Um, and I think it worked well because uh, everyone communicated well um, and everyone was flexible. That included the timeline, um, you know, and uh, on both sides. Uh, we, okay, then I uh, went to identify uh, compatibility of the different contrib modules that were used. Uh, this was an input into whether to build on Drupal 8 or Drupal 9, uh, because there are some modules that are on Drupal 8 that have not yet been uh, fixed, right, to work with the deprecations in Drupal 9. Uh, needed to identify some patches, uh, or, or in one case, write a, a patch uh, to a module to make it compatible. And of the 227 modules that were used in Drupal 7, we were down to 151 uh, in a development environment in Drupal 9, uh, 144 in production. Uh, so then uh, we inventoried the site. Uh, in particular, we were looking for things that didn't need to be migrated uh, because as I said, we wanna keep that scope uh, really limited. Uh, we, I also evaluated the custom module logic that was there in Drupal 7 to see what needed to be re-implemented uh, in Drupal 9 and how we wanted to do that. Uh, and then inventoried the content types, fields, taxonomies, all that site content uh, and structure to see what needed migration. Uh, then set up GitHub for source control and issue tracking, uh, set up Lando uh, locally uh, for local, uh, local development environment of uh, the Drupal 9 site, began building the Drupal 9 site um, and the CI CD pipeline uh, to deploy uh, to Pantheon, uh, trained the GLI staff on Drupal 9 development workflows. Uh, so for example, configuration management, which they were not familiar with coming from Drupal 7. <clears throat> uh, then set up another instance of Lando locally uh, for Drupal 7. Uh, so this served as a source of, uh, of content and structure to migrate during development. <clears throat> uh, then set up a Pantheon multi-dev environment as a migration source uh, to be used for the real migration. Um, that was a bit of a strange choice perhaps for me <laughs> um, that I, uh, it basically was just the easiest way to do it. Uh, <clears throat> Pantheon, you can have these different multi-dev environments and uh, we, I basically just used one of those environments as databases as I just stuck the Drupal 7 database up there uh, so it could be used for, for the migration even though the whole rest of the multi-dev environments and the rest of that Pantheon site were Drupal 9. 
Uh, okay, then uh, implemented and tested the logic to migrate the site structure. It's basically configuration, right? Content types, field configurations, and lots, lots more. Uh, executed that structure migration. Then began the third party integration. So the Salesforce integration, uh, the SSO integration with Talent LMS, uh, the, some pre fill, sort of form pre fill redirect custom logic for Soapbox. Uh, spent a little time onboarding the front end contractors, uh, getting them uh, working with Lando and Pantheon, GitHub, and the CI CD. Uh, implemented and tested logic to migrate site content. So nodes, taxonomy terms, users, files, et cetera. Uh, executed uh, a temporary partial migration on a Pantheon multi-dev environment to keep the front end team unblocked. So there was a lot they could do before there was any content in Drupal 9 uh, as far as getting the, the theme ported, but they did need actual content uh, in Drupal 9 uh, to complete the theming. And so that was the purpose of that. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, okay, what do we do next? Uh, then executed an initial content migration, full content migration uh, in the Pantheon live environment. Uh, and as I'll talk about a little more, some of that had to be do, done locally uh, due to some memory constraints on Pantheon. Uh, then executed uh, some incremental content migrations uh, to get the latest content, bring uh, Pantheon, Pantheon's live environment for Drupal 9 up to date with that on, on Drupal 7 uh, for testing. Um, and also for incorporating uh, a few tweaks uh, to that logic uh, for the final migration. Uh, then uh, we uh, implemented and tested the logic to import the contact data, which was in Civi CRM, but had been migrated to Salesforce uh, by the other company and then exported from Salesforce. And then I needed to import that into Drupal 9 into the user fields to seed Drupal 9 with this data for over 400,000 users because uh, we needed the data to match in Salesforce and Drupal so that the two-way sync uh, didn't get confused and overwrite uh, data in Salesforce with empty blank data in Drupal. Uh, then we executed uh, the import of that data. Okay, we just talked about that. And then finally, we ex I executed the final migration from Drupal 7. We went live on June 7th. And uh, then there was some post-launch support after that. So that's the high level kind of what we did. Um, and before I go on, I should say, I keep kind of flipping between I and we, <laughs> because we did work collaboratively uh, as a team. Uh, I you know, was an extension of the GLI team for this. Uh, and so while the vast majority of the migration work was done by me and a lot of the other work, there were bits and pieces that the GLI team uh, did implement. And then there were bits and pieces that the front end team, uh, the contractors that came in uh, implemented. So it's all a little bit blurry and I didn't wanna give you kind of just information about what I did. It's not as relevant as sort of the whole project. <clears throat> okay, so these are the final migration steps. And I thought you'd find this interesting. It's kind of, what did we do on the go live day? Um, <clears throat> and you'll see in square brackets some timings. Uh, those timings are not actually from Go live. Uh, they are from one of the incremental migrations that happened uh, before Go live, but they are they approximate the kind of duration uh, that it would have taken on Go live day. I was a little busy on Go live day, so I wasn't taking the timings. Um, but just to give you a flavor, <clears throat> so we started around 10 a.m. I'm not a morning person, um, and started by copying the files uh, from Drupal 7 production. Uh, to my local environment using an incremental rsync command. Then copied those files from my local uh, machine to the Drupal 9 Pantheon live environment, again, incrementally using rsync. <clears throat> uh, and that didn't take long at all, uh, because while there were 71 gigabytes of files, we'd already done that, right? It was just, you know, basically what had changed, or rather what additional files were added in about a week, week and a half uh, before the final uh, go live migration. Uh, then uh, exported the database uh, from the Drupal 7 production site uh, using Drush SQL dump. Copied that uh, locally using rsync, unzipped it, and then <clears throat> uh, emptied out, dropped the database on the Pantheon, on a Pantheon multi-dev environment uh, that we were going to use as the Drupal 7 
uh, migration source, uh, imported that uh, D7 database up to that multi-dev environment. <laughs> That's the piece that took the longest. Um, and then we enabled maintenance mode uh, for the Drupal 9 site. Uh, the Drupal 7 site remained available, accessible to users throughout. Um, so there was no, no downtime for them. Uh, <clears throat> the only caveat there is that the database dump that we took in the morning of go live day, which was a Monday, uh, was going to be the final migration of data. So any data in the database that changed after that database dump was taken, you know, around 10.30 a.m., uh, was not going to make it over to Drupal 9. And so uh, that decision was made to, to keep the scope limited uh, and to, to keep things a little easier um, for, for everyone involved. <clears throat> it did mean that the GLI team needed to follow up with some folks uh, about a few changes that were made on the site. Uh, their editors were informed in, in advance, their content editors, any changes they make after that time, they'll have to make again in the Drupal 9 site. Wasn't a big deal. Um, then uh, we begin executing the different migrations. So first up, the users. And that was again an incremental migration. Uh, any <clears throat> any users, uh, new users. Um, and let's see, what else do we do? Actually, it was done based on when the users last uh, accessed a page on the site or logged in. Um, and the reason we had to do that is because Drupal 9 does not keep track of when user data last changed. There's no way to kind of query for that like when they last submitted the form um, <clears throat> to change their, their profile information or their password, for example. Um, so the best we could do is approximate, okay, when was the last time that a, a user was active on the site? And based on that, say, okay, we're going to import them. Uh, and that was going to be an, uh, kind of a update an upsert, right? Update insert operation. So <clears throat> if it was a new user, okay, we're going to create the new user in Drupal 9. Um, and if it already exists, we're going to update it with all the field data, passwords, et cetera, uh, from Drupal 7. Make sure we have the latest in there before we go live. Okay, so next, uh, files. Didn't take long at all. Again, uh, there weren't many files. Keep in mind, we'd already moved or copied the files from my local environment up to Pantheon uh, live environment. But this is <clears throat> affecting the, the managed files in the Drupal database, right? So Drupal has a database table where it keeps track of all of the files and uh, has a reference to them on the file system. And so that's what this migration is about. Uh, then uh, we migrated taxonomy terms. Um, and this was a full migration rather than an incremental migration uh, because uh, it wasn't feasible to do an incremental migration for the taxonomy terms. <clears throat> um, I don't remember exactly why. I think it may have been, again, uh, because there's no way to determine if it had been modified. Um, and it was just quicker and easier to say, all right, we're just going to migrate them all. Um, we just did that for certain taxonomies, though. Um, there were some taxonomies where we knew there were no changes, and they were huge. And it would have been a big waste of time to remigrate them, so we didn't do that. Uh, then we uh, migrated uh, any changed nodes or new nodes, <clears throat> then path redirects, URL aliases, uh, menu links, uh, and that was incremental, uh, basically focused on new content. Um, we weren't, weren't too concerned about that content changing. It just doesn't change that often. Um, and we were talking about about a week before go live when there would have been a window for, uh, you know, kind of data or content error to be introduced. Then we flipped on the Salesforce integration. That couldn't be flipped on before the user migration uh, because we didn't want the importing of these users from Drupal 7 to trigger the two-way sync with Salesforce during the migration timeline. <clears throat> uh, okay, so then we disabled maintenance mode. Uh, we indexed uh, things in Solar and XML sitemap um, that had just been newly uh, migrated in. Uh, the GLI team had a few manual content updates um, <clears throat> that was going to be more work to automate uh, as part of the migration. We decided we'll just do it at the end uh, of the, the go live migration steps. Didn't take very long. We did some smoke testing, then we cut over the DNS uh, to the 
the primary real domain for the site, did some final testing and signed off the night around 10.30 in the evening. Phew, it was a long day. Uh, okay, <clears throat> so timeline, just to give you a rough sense, in early November of last year uh, was initial discovery and a, a quick estimation exercise to get a ballpark. Uh, project kicked off in mid-November, uh, first git commits went early December, uh, late January migrated the, the structure, content types, other configuration. Uh, late March uh, did a partial content migration for the front end team. Uh, late April did that initial full content migration to the Pantheon live environment. And then in early June, uh, we had our final migration and go live. <clears throat> that timeline is missing a whole bunch of minutia, especially some of the new work. Uh, the Salesforce integration in particular was, was the big, big item. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think it's rare that you hear a talk about something like this or really have a sense for how long this stuff takes. <laughs> so I wanted to be able, wanted to be sure to share that. Um, so this project, and keeping in mind that a lot of this time was the Salesforce integration and some of the other new work, took 380 hours of my time. Um, and so you can see the breakdown per week see when I spent the time on this handy graph here. I'll leave that for a moment for you to digest. Uh, and this, this actually leaves off some time towards the end. Uh, that last bar should actually be a bit higher, but <laughs> it's just the data I had easy access to. So okay. some of the, yeah, go ahead, Slim. Later on, can you talk about what you did for Salesforce integration? Uh, sure, yeah, let's, um, when we run out of migration related questions, we can absolutely switch over to, to Salesforce stuff. It's, it's, it could be a whole nother talk. <laughs> so um, some tools uh, that were used, um, Lando we talked about, uh, Pantheon's Terminus command line interface, uh, which was used primarily for running Drush commands uh, against Pantheon's environments. Uh, the Migrate Tools module, uh, which extends uh, the Drupal uh, Migrate API with uh, Drush support, <clears throat> uh, which was very important for this project. Uh, the Migrate Plus module, which provides some additional uh, Migrate plugins, source plugins, destination plugins, process plugins. Um, okay, so we're almost at the end of my spiel. So a few lessons learned. So one, Salesforce integrations are really difficult uh, with Drupal. Uh, there's a Salesforce Drupal module, uh, which does a lot. Um, and I had used it a long time ago in Drupal 7, many, many years ago. <clears throat> uh, it's, it's different <laughs> in Drupal uh, 8, Drupal 9. Um, and it doesn't do some things well. Uh, one, it doesn't properly detect the deletion of Salesforce objects. Um, despite claiming that it does. <laughs> um, and with a two-way sync where we needed to be concerned with uh, whether things got deleted, we needed to delete them in the other place, or at least mark them as deleted. Uh, that was a problem. So we had to work around that. Uh, it doesn't support syncing multi-value fields. Um, so that was problematic for, for some of the things we needed to sync. Um, we decided on an ugly workaround to sync user roles being added or removed from a user in Drupal or a contact in Salesforce. <clears throat> uh, so the, the use case there was um, uh, in, if somebody makes, if somebody goes to the Soapbox Engage shop to purchase a self-paced course or a membership, that then syncs that purchase information up to Salesforce. And Salesforce then has automation that says, hey Drupal, you need to add this role uh, so that this person who just purchased something can access it. Uh, and so we needed the ability to, to, to both add and remove roles on either system and have that sync uh, to the other one. Uh, and it was, it was, it was ugly, <laughs> but we made it happen. Uh, and another one, uh, so syncing structured validated address data. So like ISO state and country abbreviations uh, requires the address module uh, in Drupal, which is great, uh, does a really good job. And it also requires enabling Salesforce's state country pick lists, which is an optional and relatively new feature in Salesforce, 
um, <clears throat> that converts Salesforce's kind of free form entry, throw whatever you want in this field, uh, you know, for um, state or country, for example, uh, with actual drop down lists, right? Select lists with only the options that are actually ISO standard states and countries. Um, and that complicates importing the data into Salesforce. Uh, and it also complicates uh, integrations between Salesforce and other systems that don't support uh, those kind of ISO standards. Um, so that was one, <laughs> one thing we had to keep going back and forth uh, because we had so many different systems that cared about the address data. And we had to figure out uh, you know, the, the pros and cons of, of each of the, the options there. Uh, migrations on Pantheon are difficult. Uh, so Pantheon is really great. I love Pantheon. It's optimized for serving web pages, not executing migration tasks. Um, <clears throat> so executing the migrations locally took about one third of the time that it took to execute them actually on Pantheon. Um, also encountered a lot of out of memory errors on Pantheon. Uh, some of that I was able to work around. Uh, and then for, for some, I ended up just performing the migration locally and pushing my local database up to Pantheon, uh, which is not an elegant solution uh, exactly. <clears throat> um, but thankfully, we were in a situation where we could do that. It was the easiest option. Nobody needed to use the live environment. It wasn't being used yet. Um, so I, it was something that I could manage without inconveniencing anybody else. Did you, did you do that during the live migration? No, thankfully, the live migration did not require it. Um, yeah, that would have been much more problematic. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> uh, okay, so sometimes the wrong way is really the right way. Um, so I talked about the Salesforce contact data, right, that came from Civi CRM and was exported from Salesforce. It was exported to CSV format. And I originally implemented a way to, to import this uh, data into Drupal 9 user fields using the feeds module. And after I, I you know, implemented it, got it working, found out it took way too long. <laughs> so it was going to take, it was going to take, the import of that data was going to take beyond the go live date. And that wasn't, that wasn't okay. <laughs> um, so uh, I ended up crafting SQL insert statements using Excel formulas based on that, those CSV files. Uh, which is definitely the wrong way to do it. No, no, uh, hang on, hang on. I'm so sorry, <laughs> sorry to interrupt you. I've, no, never done, I've never done a migration that didn't also include some MySQL uh, work. <laughs> okay, and then and then my sure. other yeah. Sorry, I, I'm not no, trying, no, I'm trying to get, get in your face here, but <laughs> what 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 is? Excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me. What is this, the status? Oh, I'll get there. Sorry, everyone. <clears throat> what is the status of the feeds module in Drupal nine? Uh, it works. At least works. I was using it for, yeah. Okay, cool. It was, it was, it was slow. <laughs> um, I don't actually know whether that was the fault of the feeds module um, or possibly, uh, you know, hook invocations, yeah. events firing uh, when the data was changed. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> didn't matter. Found found the workaround. Yeah, oh, yeah. It's just, just wondering. It's been around forever, right? I remember that feeds yep. module. Gosh, that's been, that's been here. <laughs> uh, that's been a thing if you could do it you could you know you could really get some work out of it but that yep. was yeah that was a lot of big learning it was alive and kicking i, I ended up uh, i implemented some custom feed module plugins so it's you know it's using plugins the right way in drupal 9 um to to mm -hmm. alter some of the data and and tweak some stuff so it's fully functional as best i can tell cool okay and finally this was a uh a troublesome one. So after go live, users had trouble logging in to the new website due to cookies that had been set by Drupal 7 on that same primary domain before the DNS cut over. Uh, and the solution was for users to clear their browser's cookies, which uh, for uh, 400,000 some users, not all of whom were active and actually running into the problem, right? But uh, for a whole bunch of users, that's a big deal, particularly uh, because of all the technical support uh, that it, it requires, especially with a user base that is not necessarily very technically inclined. Um, so clearing the browser's cookies is not something that everybody knows how to do. Uh, so it would have been much better had we caught uh, and worked around that in advance. 
And now it is truly question time. <laughs> and I invite anybody who wants to speak up with an answer to a question to also uh, just go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, I don't consider myself a migration expert. Uh, I am able to figure things out and that's what I did for this project. So um, I welcome any and all questions and uh, we can, I can switch, switch to uh, uh, sharing the code, sharing spreadsheets, uh, you name it. Yeah, I've got a question, JD, this is Jason. Um, you, you mentioned that, you know, Pantheon as a migration environment is, is pretty much a non-starter. Uh, for, for your local migrations, um, can you talk a little bit about any MySQL optimizations or PHP configuration that, that you set up to, to make those migrations run more quickly? Uh, I didn't do a lot um, locally. The, the, there were, it basically it was gonna take me longer to identify and actually implement those kinds of optimizations locally than it would to just let it execute. <laughs> um, but what I did do is I, I found um, there's a migration booster module, migrate boost yeah, or something. Mi migrate boost, yeah. Yep, um, which I needed to, to patch to get working with Drupal 9. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I enabled that. I didn't benchmark it before and after. <laughs> um, but in theory, that would have reduced the time. Um, mm -hmm. And that I think may have contributed to being able to execute some of the migrations on Pantheon that I couldn't before. Um, the other very helpful thing uh, that I did, having researched online, finding some useful blog posts, uh, was setting a, a, some configuration in the migration configuration YAML files um, <clears throat> that basically set batch sizes. Right. Um, and mm -hmm. I forget, we can go look at it. Uh, if we want, but um, they're, they're kind of two numbers. I think one is uh, 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 goes into the SQL query and becomes a, you know, the, limits the SQL query to a certain number at a time mm -hmm. uh, and then paginates that uh, over time. And the other one is, I just, I think how many entities are processed or items are processed. Yeah, bat batch at, size. At yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, so bringing those down uh, also allowed uh, a bunch of the stuff to, function on Pantheon that it, it wouldn't initially. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that helped is that uh, certainly at least by the time we did the final migration and some of the incremental migrations before that, uh, the Pantheon site had been upgraded. Uh, and so the memory got doubled. <laughs> that helped. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah. And I, I'm not super familiar with, with Pantheon and, and its file storage um, architecture. But what, was there a, a, any consideration given to um, hosting files from, say, an S3 bucket? Yeah, I mean, I, I considered it. Sh I, I shuffling can, things around. I considered it. It's not something I ever ended up discussing uh, with the client uh, because Pantheon was going to serve the needs well. Mm -hmm. um, Pantheon does have some limitations, I think, from a performance perspective, if you get too many files in a single directory. Mm -hmm. um, and I checked and that we weren't going to run into that issue. Um, uh, I also think there may be a soft limit. Uh, they suggest maybe from performance perspective, of maybe 200 gigabytes of files, but I, I could be wrong. That's just off the top of my head. And I may be thinking of some other limit. Mm -hmm. um, they use a network file system that's proprietary uh, to them. Um, and uh, just uh, uploaded things with rsync. You can also use F uh, SFTP uh, to, to access it, um, and it's it's separate. It's it's separate from the the code, uh, mm -hmm. so it's not not all kind of the same file system. And just just so I understand correctly, and this will be my last question. Um, it, did I did I read that slide correctly that you were able to execute? Uh, a 425,000 uh, 425, nodes in uh, 23 minutes, was that right? <laughs> no, what you were looking at was a timing for an incremental migration. So it wasn't the initial full uh, okay. set of, of data. Yeah, it would have been, it would have been perhaps, um, it was probably the users, it was I think 425,000 users. Mm -hmm. And it would have been just whichever users had uh, logged in uh, or access to page or been created 
since uh, the last incremental migration. Was I done. see. Okay. Wow. That's a huge relief to hear. I'm not losing my mind. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks very much. Hi, Judy. Okay. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I just had a question. I'm curious if you had um, as many troubles as I have had with our sync uh, with Pantheon. And to be fair to Pantheon, uh, I think it was the situation that was ridiculous. I had a top level files directory with over 14,000 files in it. And so Pantheon RSync does have troubles with that. And I ended up having to just divvy it up and do um, yeah. batches. <clears throat> so that's that's actually the problem I alluded to earlier in their, their performance limitation uh, on having too many files in a given directory. Yeah. Uh, if it's nested, it's not a problem. Right. In any given directory, it sounds like that's what you ran into. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Our, our sync uh, worked well. Um, I'm not an rsync expert, <laughs> so I had to do a bunch of research to figure out how do I actually get this to work incrementally. It's not something I know off the top of my head. That took a little time. Um, one thing that I thought was kind of interesting was, uh, <clears throat> so I had to craft two different rsync commands. One, to get the files down from Drupal 7 production on DigitalOcean to my local, and then another from my local uh, up to Pantheon. And the, the, the way to do the incremental up to Pantheon was to have kind of a subcommand ran a, a find command and found files that had been uh, added to the file system in the last hour, <laughs> basically, uh, because my the, the directory where I was uh, incrementally migrating down already contained all the previous files. Uh, and so I had no other marker or kind of way to determine, okay, what are the ones I just brought down? That took some figuring. Cool. Um, JD, have you, do you have any trouble with Apache Solar? Or somebody else say no <clears throat> when they migrate to Pantheon with their D9 site. When they went to run Apache Solar, they found it was kind of outdated and had problems. Yes, yeah, Scott. So Pantheon Solar is definitely outdated. <laughs> and um, for that reason, we did not use it. Uh, I know they're planning on, on upping that version. I don't know, sometime this year, <laughs> I think. Yeah, they, um, they, they actually said that two years ago. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's actually going to happen this year is my bet. But um, we used Open Solar, uh, which is the third party uh, solar platform. Um, and it's it's where Pantheon points everybody who <laughs> asks about solar um, because Pantheon knows their solar uh, offerings are not not really up to scratch. Eh, it's being eclipsed by other systems. <laughs> maybe, maybe so. And um, Open Solar worked well. One thing that was strange with Open Solar, I'd never worked with it before. Um, <clears throat> is that their definition of what an index is, is not the same thing as the definition of an index from the Drupal uh, search API and solar module perspective. And so that tripped me up initially. <laughs> um, I don't remember the, the details, but it's basically a completely different thing. Um, I think they treat an index as a, uh, what's it called? I don't know, like a solar node, that might be the wrong term. Um, but basically a solar instance. Uh, and uh, open solar, uh, you can have uh, single uh, instances or you can have clustered uh, sort of more high availability instances. And so um, we went with a mix of the two. So for non-production sites, we used uh, the single instance and for you know the live site, uh, we used a, a cluster, um, which to Drupal, it doesn't know the difference. You just point it, you know, at the, uh, the right domain with the right credentials and uh, open solar takes care of the, the clustering. Uh, hi, Zadie, this is Niraz. How did you uh, convert uh, the country module that are not compatible to D9? Did you end up uh, creating custom module or? Hey, Niraj, yeah, so <clears throat> there was one uh, where it was, I think as simple as adding the core version requirement uh, to the info.yaml file. Um, uh, that was that was pretty straightforward. Uh, the challenge was when you do that, uh, you can't you can't apply that change successfully using composer uh, kind of patch management. I <laughs> uh, yeah. Sorry. I can see Eric Eric's, Eric's oh, yeah. that one before. Tell the story. This is a good story and people should people should know about this. Go ahead, JD. <laughs> so um, what, what I did is 
What did I do? <laughs> I think I forked uh, the mod, or no, I didn't fork. Yes, the yes, this is correct. You forked well, well, the I, you, well, you you could you could fork it. I sort of forked it. I I did. I used an issue fork uh, on Drupal.org, nice new shiny capability, um, mm -hmm. and uh, apply the, the patch you know to that uh, that forked uh, repository in the branch there, mm -hmm. and then you can tweak your composer.json uh, to point for a given project uh, to a specific branch at a specific repository. And maybe I'll switch over to composer.json and show you um, that is a useful thing to know. You can also host your path mods, path file to a separate location. Your what file? The path file. Say again, one more time. The Drupal path file, the path file that you, you, you have. I don't recognize that term, path file? Pats. Patch. What? Patch. 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 Patch file. Oh, no, no. You, you see, the problem here is you, you is um, Composer will not build your site because you are not meeting the requirements of Composer. So you're caught in like, you're caught in like a yeah. double bind here, right? Okay. If, okay. Without the core version requirement in the info.yaml, right? Composer takes a look at that module and says, nope, not building here because you're not, you're not, you know, I can't, I can't work with this module. So you need to do this. You need to do a JD is sorry. And, and sorry. so I, I talked about using an issue fork on Drupal.org, but uh, maybe I'm confusing it with another project. Here, I, I forked it on GitHub, um, the Migrate Booster module. Uh, and oh, I you came up with your, you, you rolled your own here. Yeah, I did. Person. Yeah, yeah, because really what they're, what they're looking for us to do on Drupal.org, and, and Neil, Neil, I'm sure, can confirm, confirm more or not, but we're looking for us to do an issue, a fork of the module, which goes to GitLab, and then you're using the GitLab fork to which you have now made your changes. So it looks almost like yeah. this. It's, it's very similar, and I, I did actually do it the right way for another project. This, this module, though, was already on GitHub. I think it had, didn't have a Drupal 9 release on, uh, or, or even a branch, I think, available on Drupal.org, and I think that's why I'm here on GitHub. Yeah, I, I took some of them. There was, there was an, there was an automated bot on um, Drupal.org, which is, which is writing an issue on contrib modules called Drupal 9 Readiness, and I, I forked a lot of those. Into, into GitLab, but this this works, and and th and this is good. This is this is the thing. It's just just JD is doing it on GitHub when when Drupal.org is looking for us to do it on GitLab. So there's there's a couple of good posts out on on this. Um, I'll be happy to share. Why don't I put those in the chat? Go ahead. I'm sorry. I I don't mean to do a little talking. Oh no, all are welcome. Who's got a question? Uh, I have one more question. And for migrating content type, how easy would that be from Drupal 7 or Drupal 6 to 8 or 9? Is that just taken care by a Drupal migrate module from the core, uh, from the contrib module? So there is a Drush command, and I'm blanking on the command, but um, there's a Drush command provided by the migrate tools module that basically lets you um, generate a configuration YAML file actually a whole bunch of configuration YAML files uh, that define the migration. Um, and so this is what I used uh, to automatically generate a bunch of configuration YAML files uh, to migrate the content types and all of the other configuration from Drupal 7 to Drupal 9. Um, and so you're able to do a lot really quickly. Uh, and it's also a very powerful system where you can tweak the logic either in the configuration YAML files that get generated, you can manually modify them uh, to use you know, different uh, steps, different uh, process plugins, et cetera. Um, or you can use, uh, you can write custom modules uh, that uh, implement, uh, I think they're event listeners uh, to, to tweak, uh, you know, the data as it's being processed. Um, so I can switch over here and show you an example yeah, of the configuration. And uh, I just I just exported configuration just in the main config directory. Some would say that you're better off doing it in a, uh, a separate module folder, but quick and dirty works. Um, what, so, what, what was the command that we ran Drust to generate uh, export uh, Drupal seven to nine? I am going to cheat and look that up. <laughs> 
Thank um, you. Let's see. Hmm. I'm not seeing it uh, easily, but it's definitely out there. Does anybody know off the top of their head? What was the question again? I'm sorry. For uh, migrating. The, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, what, what is the Drush command that you use to generate the configuration YAML files for migration? Drush command you use to generate. You're talking about Drush, Drush export? Drush import, that 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 range of files no, of commands. No, I'm I'm trying to find out if you have D7 or D6 side, and if you want to migrate all the content type to D9, what is the process like? How would you start? Oh, that's a big question. But you know, J JD just did all that. <laughs> <laughs> just so, hand it over to JD. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So I was uh, I was just trying to run Drush and do a grep on the output to find the right migrate command. <laughs> but my, my Docker is starting up, so it's gonna be a while. Um, <clears throat> oh, I, I can help here. Um, go ahead, I'm sorry, you, 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 you were saying something, JD. Nope, that was it. <laughs> oh, okay, so, so there are some good tools out there that give you an idea of um, what you need to change um, to, to convert your modules from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8 slash 9 compatibility. Right, so the, the YAML system, the configuration YAML system in Drupal didn't exist until Drupal 8, right? So, so I see a lot of D7 there in, in the list that JD is showing us, but that doesn't really mean that these, those YAML files are used in the D7 versions of the modules, they're not. Okay, so there are, are, are you with me? Are you with me so far? You're on? Um, yeah, not, not sure. Uh, my question was, let's say I have a D7 side and I want to convert that to a D9. What is the process? Like in D7, uh, you may need to use maybe draw seven. Uh, I don't know if it's, it, it's compatible yeah. with D7, D, uh, draw eight. Uh, I know some of the command that you can run, but do I need to install draw nine in D7 side or no, is there any... no, that won't work. No, no, they, no. There, there's a whole. There was a whole process to get your modules over from D7 to D8, and there was a really good convert convert module out there that was that was so, um, highly supported for a long time. So one module that I uh, used, although I had some issues with it, but it, it was helpful, was the migrate upgrade module. Is, is that what we're talking about? That's and, what I, yes, it is. That's the yeah, model. Yep. Yeah. And so with that, what you do is you install that on your D9 site and there's um, a command where you tell it, uh, and they're all the, the Drush migrate upgrade commands. Like I'll put an example of one here in chat, even though this isn't going to be durable. So. Uh, yeah, Anne's got it. I forgot to mention that yes. module. That is the module that provides the command that you were asking about, Naraj. <laughs> yeah, uh, ignore part of that, that fly SFO, but ignore that because uh, I, I was using Terminus. This is this was actually um, in a, actually in my container. So it was in the Doxel container. So the real command was fin Terminus Drush. Okay, and so this will convert this will convert D7 database to D9 database. Well, not really. So what this does is it, um, generates, it looks at your D7 site and like it looks at all the content types and all the taxonomy vocabularies and everything. It's kind of amazing. And what it does is it, it generates a migration YAML file that effectively would be able to, um, when you run that migration file would actually do the migrating. You'd have to connect the database and the data somehow and just, you'd still have to do some of that. But it would basically create the YAMLs for you. Now, with my experience with this module though was, was imperfect in that, um, I don't know why, but it always failed at 50% through the process of generating all the config. So it would give me a lot of what I needed, but what I'd end up with is sort of these um, content types that were sort of halflings. And what I mean is they uh, were content types where all their fields had been migrated, all the storage, uh, config mm -hmm. had been migrated, but not the uh, the part of the config that lets the field know it's connected to the content type. But that was okay because going through and just manually saying add field, 
all my fields existed. So I could just add existing fields. So that was a little bit of a pain, but I think that might've been unique to what I was doing or user error of yeah. some kind, I'm sure. But that's <laughs> awesome. I know that, yeah, no, that's really awesome. I'm remembering a, a migrate module from D7 to D8, right? And, and in, in this context, Niraj, um, D8 and D9 are the same thing. Right. Yeah. So what I'm remembering a, um, a conversion, a, a, the conversion, a module for D7 or D8, I forget, probably D7, that gave you a report like in HTML or in uh, something like that. And then you could see what needed to be to be changed. And then you would go in and change it. I think it was the same module. I think it's a um, migrate upgrade module. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. It is, yeah. I just want to, I just want to add one thing that, you know, sometimes it's, it's um, we're reluctant to take off our developer hat and 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 just look at the content management system for what it is and say you know what instead of trying to get through an imperfect rush migration or configuration migration, I can just build it in the front end in you know a few hours. And there's, well, no, there's no shame in that. No, of course not. I mean, solution, solu providing a solution is, is what, we're, what we really are doing. That's really our job. But when we're talking about a site with 250,000 or 425,000 um, users, right? And I, I don't- Yeah, I don't but recall. we're talking about migrating content types. Oh, right. yeah. oh fair enough. Oh, fair enough. Yeah. yeah. Although in this, in this case, yeah. we were looking at, I think it was 147 fields um, and many more uh -huh. instances. So to, to manually, um, add those would take an extraordinary amount of time uh, and especially to get it right and then to uh, be able to actually migrate the content into them. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Without, without I'm just saying, effort. you know, for, for some projects, you have maybe 20 content types with a handful of fields and, yeah. It, yeah. you know, we just, I, it, it's just a cautionary tale that, yeah. you know, you can, Agreed. you can just get so locked into what can Drush do for me. Yeah. yeah. And without just take a step back and say, you know, there's this very nicely working UI that I can use to, to get the job done in half the time and one tenth of the frustration. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I, I agree with you there. I mean, once you're in Drupal 8, writing fields from code becomes not trivial, but relatively formulaic, whereas, you know, it used to be another thing in Drupal 7, right? But it's easier just to click buttons on the UI and then just save your config. Or, or yeah, or just, you know, hopefully you can generate a module from another project and use that as a, mm. as a skeleton for whatever content type you have, and then use, you know, uh, trash migration tool or configuration import to, to bring that into, um, into your baseline Drupal database. So Niraj, to, to answer your, your question more properly now. <laughs> um, yeah. So yes, Drush migrate update, upgrade, and then you specify the Drupal 7 database credentials that you need to access the Drupal 7 database. You don't need to modify your Drupal 7 instance at all. You just need to make it available to your Drupal 9 instance uh, or, or actually to Drush. Um, <clears throat> and then this uh, configure only uh, parameter uh, means that it doesn't then tr go ahead and execute all the migrations, which is not what you want when you're developing, tweaking, testing. Um, you just want it to generate the configuration YAML files, which you can then run, you know, individually or all together and do your testing and, and uh, you know, iterate uh, on yeah. that process over time. Yeah, and as JD mentioned earlier, it's nice because you can customize it and take it a step further too. So like in our case, we didn't wanna just migrate files to files. We wanted to migrate files to files to media images and documents that were attached. And so you can really just by tweaking what was automatically generated, you can do like some pretty amazing things like that. Um, you know. And it's hard the first time, of course, figuring it out. But after that, then you can like <laughs> you can do that all the time, and it's it's not that hard. It's actually amazingly sometimes just two more lines of of, of config in the YAML. So it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And mm -hmm. here's an example of one of the YAML files that that command generates. Um, so you asked about content types. So this migrates the content types, um, <clears throat> and so you could spend hours on this, but <laughs> um, very briefly. Uh, the kind of key things going on here is it uh, 
well, let's just go down to the source. So you specify the source plugin. So this plugin is provided uh, by Drupal Core. Um, and I think Drupal Core the migrate. Yeah, migrates in Core now. Um, and basically, there's a plugin that knows how to extract content type information from Drupal 7. And this is its ID. Uh, and then you have process plugins that take the data that that source plugin provides and does stuff with it. Um, and in particular, it's just kind of getting it ready to then stick into Drupal 9. Um, and so this was all generated automatically. I didn't have to do anything. And it just knows what to do. And then the destination plugin, also provided by Drupal Core, is called Entity Node Type. And so Drupal knows how to take the data here, stick it into Drupal 9. Um, so the content types, I didn't have to make any changes, right? This is plug and play. I run the, uh, if, if all I wanted to do was migrate content types, uh, I wouldn't even have to do that configure only step, right? I could just say, uh, specify, right, which, uh, which thing I want to configure on the command line <clears throat> or migrate. It would generate the YAML, it would execute the migration, I'd be done. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions out there? I know we're uh, getting to time here. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so for the, when you migrated the users into the Drupal 9 instance, um, was the CSV from a the Civic CRM or from the Salesforce? Um, I'm just curious how you were able to map the Salesforce IDs. So I'm, yeah. I'm currently managing a Drupal 7 site with Salesforce syncs and whatnot. So I'm just curious um, <laughs> how were you able to do all yeah. the mapping and the syncing? So there were, there were multiple steps. Um, <clears throat> first, there was just the very basic migration of Drupal 7 users to Drupal 9 users. Uh, that didn't involve Salesforce at all. And there were basically no user fields in Drupal 7. <clears throat> um, uh, so uh, all the user data was stored in Civi CRM, uh, not, in, not in Drupal 7 user fields. Um, so the, the data that was migrated as part of that migration from 7 to 9 was just the UIDs, the email addresses, the usernames, the passwords, time zone information, stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> then the, the data from Civi CRM, things like uh, the user's first name, last name, address, uh, and, and more got migrated to Salesforce, was then exported from Salesforce to a CSV. And uh, I manually added fields to the Drupal 9 user uh, entity, uh, and then, as I said, attempted <laughs> to use the feeds module to import that CSV into those fields and ended up crafting the SQL queries. Uh, oh, uh, uh, but sorry, uh, I, didn't, I didn't answer your question about mapping the Salesforce IDs. Yeah, right. <clears throat> so uh, let's see, how did I do that? <laughs> okay, so uh, the Drupal user ID in Drupal 7 was exported, was migrated over to Salesforce. And that was included along with the Salesforce ID and the CSV. So it meant when it came back to Drupal 9, and we kept the user IDs the same in Drupal 9. So we didn't change the user IDs when we did that migration. Uh, I, I already knew how to map it. OK, great. And how often are you syncing? Is it like a cron job with a queue process to sync data <clears> when it's changing Salesforce? Or is it like the automatic loop, like it's triggering a hook in Drupal? Yeah, so there are a few ways to do it. Uh, we're using a combination of uh, using the ultimate cron module uh, to configure more granularly which Drupal cron processes functions <laughs> um, are, are executed every time cron is run. And we used uh, New Relic Synthetics uh, monitors to actually execute the cron um, <clears throat> every minute. Uh, so, so things are happening every minute. Um, also, the, the Drupal Salesforce module uh, includes um, some, some endpoints that can trigger Salesforce module specific pull of data from Salesforce, push of data. <clears throat> and so we're using a mix of, of the kind of built-in Salesforce module uh, cron hooks in Drupal and the endpoints provided directly uh, by the, the Salesforce module. 
Um, awesome. And it, I didn't is, know about that. and it is a it is a polling mechanism. So nothing gets pushed from Salesforce to Drupal. It all gets pulled from Salesforce to Drupal by Drupal. Um, and changes in Drupal get pushed up to Salesforce. Uh, the changes to users get uh, done uh, in the user thread kind of a, a synchronously. Um, but any other changes are, are stuck in a queue and processed by cron. And that was just because of some specific requirements we had. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. JD, I had a question. I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, Doug. Hey. Uh, so the whole CSV and the, you know, moving, I guess they were moving databases from Civi to Salesforce, which is, a, as you said, another whole topic unto itself. Uh, but the feeds module to get the CSV file to populate the uh, user entity fields. Uh, that's uh, what was the reasoning why you had to do that? That's so that the users would see that data when they logged in on the new site? Yeah, uh, so yes, that's part of it. Um, and the, the big reason for doing it is that when somebody logs into Drupal after this migration and the go live, um, we wouldn't have their data in Drupal, right? We wouldn't have their name or their um, address or their phone number. And we wanted to give them the ability to update that, right? Edit their profile, provide that data and have that be reflected in Salesforce. But if we provide them with empty fields to then provide that information, um, if they don't fill out some of the fields that aren't required, then we would be pushing empty data up to Salesforce that already has some data there. So we wanted to make sure that we, they were gonna start with the data that we had in Salesforce so that any changes, whether they happen by the user in Drupal or by an administrator in Salesforce or automation in Salesforce, uh, syncs to the other. Okay. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, I'm just thinking, uh... It's interesting, you know, because Civi, I mean, you can obviously pull those fields in uh, using the Civi profiles and the custom. I understand they were abandoning that approach, I guess, but uh, it's, it, it seems you could easily just pull them in and then you're, if I'm understanding, you could avoid all that importing and uh, feeds module stuff. Yeah, so um, we, you're right. We could have uh, implemented a migration directly from Civi into Drupal 9. <clears throat> However, the source of record for this data was going to be Salesforce moving forward. <clears throat> so we wanted all of the data migration from Civi to Salesforce to be self-contained and all the data cleanup that needed to be done be self-contained there and not mix and match between uh, Drupal and, and Salesforce having kind of the, the data of record. So the only piece of information where Drupal is the, uh, the source of record, um, source of truth uh, are the Drupal user IDs, uh, the email address uh, associated with that account. Um, is there anything else? Password, but that doesn't get sunk. Uh, yeah. Although we've done that too. We've run scripts where we uh, carry over the password, which is really a terrible idea, I think, from a security perspective. But, uh, you know, oftentimes with the clients, they're, you know, they want it convenient, right? They want people to be able to come to the site, log in, no issues. Like you said, it creates huge support issues if you've got a new site and everybody's trying to create a new account and stuff like that. But uh, interesting. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, I don't, I don't know of any specific security concerns with migrating Drupal 7 passwords to Drupal 9. <clears throat> um, they're, they're already, you know, salted and, and hashed, um, but there's probably something. Yeah, well, the only concern would be that the user is potentially logging in on the new site with a password that they've been using for six years, which isn't that secure from the old site, I guess. That's yeah, the only I com guess. Completely, completely agree, although uh, it's really disjoint from the migration process. All right, I'm going to say we have time for one more question. Also, zero is, is uh, acceptable. <laughs> oh, what did you do with the Salesforce? Ah, Salim, I forgot about Salesforce. <laughs> All right, Bun buckle up for the next hour. Um, <laughs> well, you could do it. You could do a separate presentation <laughs> on it, I guess. But um, I could, I could give a quick teaser. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I, I really would like to know like all the details, more details about it. So, if you want to do a 
separate presentation, I think that would be really cool. So. Yeah, I don't know if I'm going to get around to it. <laughs> um, but let me, I'm going to switch my uh, share over to the browser. I'll go to my local instance of uh, the site and show you the configuration. <clears throat> I think that will be instructive. Now that Docker is started up. Um, so if I go to structure, Salesforce, oh, this is not gonna work. Hold on, I need to tweak something in my settings.local.php. There we go. Structure, Salesforce, Salesforce mappings. This is where all the magic really of the Salesforce module happens. <clears throat> and you have um, the different mappings. So we map users in Drupal to contacts in Salesforce. This is the ugly workaround I talked about. We map user role uh, mappings. It's actually a taxonomy term that we created uh, that duplicates the user role mappings in Drupal into a taxonomy uh, term uh, to a custom Salesforce object that does the same. Uh, and then we have uh, school taxonomy terms. So these are partner schools, member schools in the GLI programs um, that map to Salesforce accounts. Um, and if the user contacts, what we've been talking about most, if we go here and we go to fields, And this is the configuration that the Salesforce module provides. Um, and here we're basically saying, let the Drupal user ID be the thing that we use to <clears throat> decide what record we update um, in Salesforce that already exists. And then we do mappings. So we map Drupal properties, fields, and information to Salesforce fields. So here you get you know, all the different fields associated with the entity that we're, we're looking to map. Um, <clears throat> so there's a lot, <laughs> right? Um, and then in this dropdown, you get all the Salesforce fields associated with the Salesforce object that we've selected to map to. And this gets pulled down from the Salesforce API. It got pulled down when I loaded this page. And you can choose whether you do a one-way migration, Drupal to Salesforce, Salesforce to Drupal, or two-way sync. Um, and you can also do, you can use data selectors. So that was necessary for the address fields because they have multiple uh, kind of pieces of data per field value. So like the state and province uh, is different from the postal code, but it doesn't show up as a separate field because it's one field with multiple columns in the database, basically. Um, I don't think I did anything else too crazy in here. But that's that's the kind of the most basic thing that the Salesforce module does. It's very powerful because it's point and click, map this field to this, here's how I want it to sync, go. <laughs> um, lots of challenges though, because for example, Boolean fields, the values don't map to what Salesforce Boolean fields map to. Um, so you got to do workarounds like create a uh, you know, text, uh, uh, I'm losing the words. <laughs> uh, there's a, a multi-value, not a multi-value, uh, text select field, right? Where you specify the keys and the values. Um, I think I ended up writing some custom code to translate some of the, the data. Uh, so this gets you a, a long, you know, a, a good chunk of the way there but you do have to fiddle and it takes a lot of time fiddling with, with the little bits that it doesn't handle. So, sorry, JD. So all the information on the left-hand side had previously been gathered on the uh, old site in user uh, fields, so, you know, I guess user entity fields, and those are going into the Salesforce objects on the right side. And that's what this, this tool is doing. So this is, this is Drupal 9 and we're looking at the fields in Drupal 9. All the user fields in Drupal 9 I created manually. They were not in Drupal 7, they were in Civi. And I, there, I did not 
automate any migration of anything from Civi to Drupal 9. Uh, so the, the structure of these fields was, was done manually. Smart decision. <laughs> not, not, not knocking Civi. It's a one, wonderful thing, but yeah, that sounds really complicated. I had the luxury of avoiding Civi for this project. No, uh, I, I don't want to sound like Johnny One Note, but I'm just trying to figure where was the data coming from, though? Because it seems like there's left side data that, I mean, it came from the old site, no phone numbers and addresses and that stuff, or, or it came from yep. Civi, I guess some of that it. Was in, that was in Civi, it went to Salesforce, it got exported from Salesforce, and then I imported it into Drupal to fill out these fields. Oh, I see, I see. And this I is see. just the mapping that then on an ongoing basis keeps it in sync with Salesforce. I could have, I could have equally uh, set up the mappings and done a force pull to pull all the data down from Salesforce. And I did that for some things, the schools, for example, um, but with, 425,000 users, it was just gonna take a lot of time. Uh, we were also a little concerned about the uh, API rate limits on Salesforce. We did get them increased for the migration, but um, just didn't wanna run into any issues there. Uh, also long running processes that might fail or get interrupted would be problematic as well. All right, with that, I'm gonna say I've run out of time <laughs> and uh, I will hand it back over to Holing. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, good job, man. Excellent. Thank you for sharing. Well, thank you, JD. I think the best meetups are always the ones that are so interactive and have so many questions. It just enriches uh, the presentation by just that much. So we have also extended a problem solving session because this is one main uh, problem that we were solving today. Uh, and the next events, uh, our next meetup is actually the Lunch and Learn. It's going to be Tuesday, July 20th at noon. And the same uh, evening slot would happen on Wednesday, August 4th at 6 p.m. Um, all times are Eastern uh, Daylight Savings Time uh, for now. Uh, so um, we are calling for speakers, organizers, and members. Uh, that there's uh, the, always, uh, we always need them. There's no such thing as too many helping hands re regarding this meetup. So uh, if you're interested in speaking, um, email us at speak at drupalmic.org. And without further ado, we're now at our after party. Uh, I'm going to hit stop recording and uh, we can go on um, and start socializing. <laughs>